Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, Angela. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Jacqueline. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Angela, for sharing the video. God bless you, Veretta. God bless you, Loretta. God bless you, Angela. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, each and every one that have dialed in tonight. Thank you for your time and your, your faithfulness in joining with me in our three times a week Bible study. And so thank you, Sister Jacqueline, for sharing the video and for you guys expanding and expounding the gospel. You know, truly, you guys are, are a wonderful tool that God is using to bless the people of the world. Because there's so many people whose lives are being changed and so many people whose lives are coming to, you know, greater uh, heights and deeper depths because you guys have shared the word of God with them. And so thank you for all that you do to pass the gospel. Amen. We're not we're not promoting a man, we're not promoting a ministry, we're promoting the word of God and getting people to get back into the kingdom of God, to get back into what God has originally designed for for all of us. Amen. God bless you, Amanda. It's good to see you. Amen. Glory be to God. And so we're going to begin shortly. We're going to ask that everybody would just you know, prepare your hearts and minds, grab your Bibles, um, so that we might study the Word of God and come to the knowledge of the truth. We want God's will to be done tonight. We want His Spirit to be glorified. We want His knowledge to be disseminated to each of you and so that you might go and share with others as well. And so we're praying for um, each and every one of you that God will continually bless you. Amen. And so let's begin tonight's study in prayer, asking God for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Um, truly, we live in a very um, uh, rough time. And so it's important for us to have our minds right as we study God's holy word. And so let's begin to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. And God, we glorify your holy name, recognizing, Father, that you are God and there is nobody like you. So have your way tonight, Lord God, and give us holy wisdom. God, we pray for your understanding. We pray for your knowledge. God, we pray for your peace. God, we pray for your glory. God, we pray for your wisdom. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, you know each of us by name. Not only those of us that are on right now, but God, even those that will be dialing in, Lord God, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that, Father, you would give us holy strength, Lord God, and that, Father, you would bless our lives, that, Father, we might do the things that brings you glory, honor, and praise. And so, Father, we thank you for your word, for your word is truth. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, and, God, we delight in your word. For you said, how can we cleanse our way by, but by taking heed to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. For thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so God bless our time tonight and give us holy revelation. Allow us to speak freely of your truth, Lord God. Forgive us of any sin or unrighteousness or anything that would hinder us from speaking your word or from hearing your word. We thank you right now, and we give you glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. God bless you. Hey, Maribel, it's good to see you. Amen. You know, I was thinking about you this week. I got to give, give you a call. Um, Tanisha, it's good to see you. Melinda, um, it's good to see you as well. God bless each and every one of you. And so, you know, tonight's topic it's called the barren altars, the barren altars. And thank you once again, those of you who have um, forwarded this video to others and, and those of you who are still doing it even now. And so thank you very much 
for all the work that you tirelessly do um, to help grow um, just the knowledge of God into the lives of people. And so, God bless you, Marilyn. It's good to see you, my sister. Um, you know, so let's let's begin tonight's study. And so, you know, tonight the topic is about the barren altars. And, and what does that mean, the barren altars? You know, um, the scripture teaches us that, it, and we're going to read it tonight, that one of the things that God has, the scripture says, he who comes to God must first believe that he is God and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so it's important to know that God, there is power. You know, the psalmist says there is power in the name of Jesus. But what we find today, in today's time, we find more people are seeing hypocrites. More people are experiencing hypocrites in their lives and false believers, you know. Um, I, I watch, oftentimes I look online and, and I see people's comments, both the world's comments as well as the church comments, people who are in the church about various believers and about things that, that we read in the reports that we see in the news and, and, and things that we see. And oftentimes what we're finding is that it seems as if those in the church are just like those in the world. And, and what happens is that it gives the world an excuse to stay away from the church. So what are the altars? The altars of God are the places where people's hearts are changed. The place where people, as we say in the churches, where we say that where people get saved, they get saved at the altar. We talk about the altar is your heart, right? But what happens when the altars of God does not produce? In fact, when you read in the word of God about a high priest called um, Eli, Eli was a high priest and this high priest was, he, he was failing to do the things of God and what he didn't even realize, he didn't even realize that the light in the temple, which represented the presence of God, the spirit of God, the anointing of God, he didn't recognize that the light was going out. In other words, that God's presence was shifting. God's presence was moving away from there because he was not doing the right thing. And many times in our lives, we don't recognize um, when we have spent our time doing everything we want to do and we leave God until the last, we leave God until after everything that we want to do is done, what happens is that sometimes when we call on him, we don't find him there. When we call on him, we don't see the power and the manifestations of God at work in our lives. And so what happens is that the, the scripture teaches us, it says, what does it profit a man or a woman for that matter to gain the whole world and to lose their soul? Like, what does it profit you to get everything you want to get, to get everything that you want to get accomplished, everything that you want to um, do in life and, uh, you know, all the achievements, all the accolades, you know, to get all that stuff and then to lose your very own soul, you know? Um, and so tonight, we want to talk about, you know, the barren altars and what does it really mean to be holy? What does it mean to be holy? You know, oftentimes when we think about the word holy, or if we say, if I ask somebody, or if I ask you, you know, who on this line is holy, one of the first things that many of us think about, we think about, well, holiness means that, you know, I'm perfect, and I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect, and Pastor Rodney, you're not perfect. But, you know, when you understand what holiness is, holiness is not something that is only for advanced Christianity. Holiness is something for every believer in the beginning, the middle, and the end. It is important that the Word of God says, the, the Word of God says that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You know, the scripture says, only the pure in heart shall see God. The scripture says, you must be holy as I am holy. So what does it mean if God is telling us that we got to be something or we got to do something? Does it mean that we can do it? Does it mean that um, it's possible? You know, so what does it mean and why has that affected the altars? Because 
the altars of God. And even in the churches, we see mega ministries. We see all churches on every corner. But if there's so many churches, why is there so much sin, both in and outside of the church? If there's so much holiness and so much power and so much anointing and so much all this stuff like that, and we got advancements in knowledge and education, and even when I look at myself, you know, that God has endowed me and blessed me with a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding, but then sometimes I'll see unrighteousness in me. And so when we look at that, you know, how do we relate that to why is it that some are effective in their ministry or their ministering, why why is there effectiveness in some, but then in others, you know, we see so much negativity, or we see hypocrisy, or we see that, you know, yeah, you got a great following, but nobody is saved. Nobody is delivered. Everybody is just letting it all hang out. So why is it that the altars are barren? The scripture teaches us, and I want you to turn with me, Right, we're gonna um, look in First Thessalonians chapter three. First Thessalonians chapter three. Okay, and when you get to First Thessalonians chapter three, I'm gonna read verses eleven to verse thirteen, and it reads: It says, "Now." May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love toward one another and to all just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, okay? So now, first of all, let's answer the question. What is holiness? Does holiness mean that you walk in, that you're perfect, right? No, holiness doesn't necessarily mean that because if you look at that, you'll find that there were many men and women who were considered holy, um, but yet and still you saw flaws in their life, right? However, flaws in your life should never be excused. It should never be excused. And, and what we find today, because we won't deal with sin in our own life, God allows for sin to be exposed in our families. And then it, it sort of judges us to see if whether we're going to love our families more than we love God, whether we're going to love our children more than we love God, whether we're going to love our spouses more than we love God. Christ says, he says, if anybody would come after me, he says, let him first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So it's important to know that you cannot do the will of God unless you first deny everything that you consider to be your own. You know, in fact, Jesus said, he says, unless you love him more than you love mother, father, sister, brother, child, or even yourself, um, you cannot be his disciples. Why? Because those things, the scripture says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So that means if I treasure my children, then Satan is not going to mess with me and my money. He's going to mess with me and my children because he knows that that has the power to distract me. If, if he knows that you can't forgive what your ex-husband or ex-wife did to you, if he knows that you can't forgive um, you know, what happened in your relationship, then he will constantly make that the foremost of your conversation and what people talk to you about. You know, he'll make that the, the number one subject. Why? Because it has the power to distract you. It has the power to pull you away from what holiness really is. And so let's talk about it. Holiness is number one, the word holy, to be holy means to be separate and set apart. It, 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 it relies upon and it sort of points to a devotion. So when you talk about being holy, when you talk about being righteous before God, the first question you have to ask yourself is, am I devoted to God? Am I um, devoted and have I devoted my body and all that I am to God, which means I put him first. 
I put him first over everything. I put him first over money. I put him first over relationships. I put him first over food. I put him first over shopping. I put him first over exercise. I put him first over vacationing. I put him first over everything, right? The more you devote yourself and the things of you to God. That's why the scripture says, if any man would save his life, he's going to lose it. But if you lose your life for Christ's sake, then you're going to gain it. What does it mean to lose your life? It doesn't mean to get lost. It means to give it away to give away. If if I give my life and my choices away and make and allow God to have precedence in what I choose to do, if I do that, the more I do that, the more holiness does the second part, which is the first part of holiness is devotion to God. The second part of holiness is moral purity. Right. And so what happens is that you could have and I'm going to share this with you for those of you who have seen people in the church who you're so quick to say that this person is a hypocrite. That person is a hypocrite. That person said you have to be very careful because the scripture says in the same way you judge another, you shall be judged. So what happens is that when you judge somebody to be a hypocrite, be careful that you're not, in fact, looking in the mirror and you're looking at the hypocrite. Because the word of God teaches us that if you are spiritual and you see somebody else that is overtaken in a fault, you are to help them, not criticize them, not condemn them, not not uh, um, a browbeat them, but you are to help them in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, in my life, you know, many of you hear that I'm very forthright with the challenges of my life and the times that I've fallen and the times that I've messed up. And I can tell you without a fact that times in my life that I messed up and I was willing to confess those things um, before the people of God, when people of God has uh, condemned me, I noticed that in their lives, they have fallen in the exact same thing that they condemned me in. So it's important to know that when we talk about holiness, if the scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. But then John 3 and 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So it's important to know that God didn't send Jesus to condemn anybody. And so that means Jesus said, as the father has sent me, even so send I you. So that means that that um, since God didn't send Jesus um, to condemn the world, then guess what? Then G Jesus is not sending you to condemn the world. But your job is to bridge the gap between what is wrong to what should be right. So that means if I see my brother, you know, like many times, you know, I'm a pastor and, you know, and I see pastors falling in sin. And so I don't get caught up in that stuff with people talking about shame on him and shame on this one and how dare he, he's a hypocrite, he's a this. What I do is pray for him and say, God, is there something I can do to help this person? Why? Because it is not God's will that anybody perish, right? But that all should come to repentance. God is not looking for us to destroy one another. He's looking for us to help one another. And so therefore, when you talk about holiness, the first part of our holiness, don't even talk to me about whether you're doing right or whether you're doing wrong if you have no devotion to God. Because if you have no devotion, if you're not fully devoted to God, you will have faults and failures in your life. I'm going to help you out tonight. I'm going to help you to realize why many of us have found ourselves in situations that we said, well, Lord, I can't seem to change this. I'm trying to get better in this. I'm trying to fix my deeds. I'm trying to, to uh, uh, do this and do that. But I'm here to tell you tonight is that the reason why you can't break free of that thing is not because there isn't any power in God. 
No, there is power in God. The altars of God are not barren. The altars of God are fruitful. The prayers of the righteous avails much, right? We know that God says, if you ask anything according to my will, it shall be done. We know that he says, when a man ways please me, I'll make his enemy his footstool. We know these things, these promises of God are true, but why is it that we don't have it? We don't have it because of the fact of the truth of the matter is, is the reason why that brother or that sister, that mother, that father, that pastor, that bishop, that apostle, that lay person, that usher, no matter who they are, the reason why they fell is because in a certain area, they was not devoted to God. They, they laid down, they laid down their shield. They laid down their faith. They laid down what they were supposed to do, and in laying down what they were supposed to do, they end up failing. I want to um, share something with you that maybe you have read before, um, uh, and maybe you have not, okay? So I want to uh, share this with you. Let me just pull this up real quick. Um, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And so y'all just give me one second. Let me just pull this up. Um, where is it? Because it just it just came into my spirit just now. And I just need to find where it is real quick. Just give me one second. Give me one second, people of God. You know, because it's important for us to know that um, many times, many times we, um, we, we, we realize, we don't realize why, you know, why we have fallen in something, why we have messed up, why we have, you know, um, you know, uh, um, we, we find that the power of God is not there, right? We... <laughs> We find that the power of God is not there. And then we find ourselves saying, well, Lord, you know, why is it that I fell? Right. Why is it? Um, why is it that I fell? Why is it that I messed up? Why is it that things didn't happen my way? Right. Um, why is it that um, I, you know, couldn't break free of this problem? You know, I couldn't break free of this problem. So it's in uh, Second Samuel's. Thank you, Lord. Second Samuel chapter 11. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 11. And um, yes. And when you get there in Second Samuel chapter 11, um, you'll find in verse 1, right? It says, um, it happened in the spring of the year. That at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Now, you may have read that before, but never really understood it, never really looked at it as though, you know, um, you never really looked at it as though, what does that mean? Look at what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now, I'm going to break it down simply. It says, now, about the time when kings were supposed to go to war, that King David sent Joab and he stayed home, right? Now, like I told you, when you think about holiness, when you think about um, breaking free, you know, some of you have sent me um, messages and asked me to pray for various things in your life, to pray that God would give you the victory over certain things, to pray that God would touch your family members and to pray that God would transform your marriage and to pray that God would, would, would bless your home and to bless your house and all these prayers. And then when, when I pray about it, you know, one of the things that the scripture says, God says, is my hand shortened that I cannot save? In other words, is God not able to break that stronghold? Is God not able to give you peace and to give you joy 
and to give you a sound mind, for the scripture says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So since God is able to give to us all that we need, then what is the problem? The problem is, the scripture says, if my people, a hypothetical situation, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. So number one, if you're going to humble yourself, and if you're going to pray, if you're going to seek his face, if you're going to turn from your wicked ways, God says, then, then, after you do that stuff, I'm going to hear your prayer, I'm going to forgive you of your sins, and I'm going to heal your land. I'm going to fix all the stuff. But what most of us want is that we want God to fix the stuff without us being fixed, without us being changed. And that's the, that's, if you will, is the chasm or the gap between um, when, when we say that we're holy, but we're not living holy. When we say that we're righteous, but we're not living righteous. Um, one of the key things um, that in, in, in the Christian walk is obedience, is obedience to God. You know, that, you know, taking care of your children there's nothing wrong with it. Going to exercise, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, having a job, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, for the Bible even says um, uh, physical exercise is good. It's good. But it says godly exercise is even better. And so, you know, one of the things that we have to always ask ourselves in, in everything you do, how often have you asked the Lord, God, is this what you want me to do today? How often have you asked the Lord that? How often have you asked the Lord, Lord, you choose what you want me to do, where you want me to go? You know, it's like today, you know, today I had to do something in the morning. And then after I went to do what I had to do, you know, there was people that were pulling on me and say, hey, come with me here and, and, and do this thing here with me and, and, and come here with me. And I, I initially said, yeah, I'll do it. But then everything my spirit says, no, go home and rest. I don't know why the Lord told me to do that. I knew I was a little bit tired, but I was like, okay, uh, I'm going to go home. So I told the per pe people, I said, listen, I'm not going to stay. Listen, I got to go and um, I'll talk to you another time. And so whatever, I left, came home, I ate some food, right? Took a shower, right? And then I decided I was sitting on the couch and I heard the Lord said, go and lay in the bed. Now, this was around 12 o'clock today. I heard the Lord say, go lay in the bed. And I went and laid down in the bed. And y'all, I didn't wake up until like 7.40. 7.40 from 12 o'clock, right? And I, and I don't know why. I was like, wow. When I woke up, <laughs> I was answering people's texts that they were texting me throughout the day. Like, good morning. Because I'm thinking it's 7 o'clock in the morning. But it's 7 o'clock at night that I end up sleeping like seven and a half hours. And it was crazy. And I don't know why the Lord told me to do that. And, and guess what? But guess what? My body needed it. The point I'm trying to say to you is this. A lot of times we go throughout our lives making our own decisions, not realizing that we've never really asked God and never really waited for God to tell us, yes, do that or no, do that. And so what happens is that our lives have become myopic. What do I mean by that? Our lives have become strong in one area, but weak and failing in other areas, right? And this is not God's will because it's God's will that everything of you would be blessed. So some of you are physically fit, but spiritually derelict. Some of you are strong when it comes to your personality, but weak when it comes to your emotions. Some of you are strong when it relates to work and you have a great financial portfolio, but you can't ward off frustration, aggravation, depression, fear, worry, doubt, and all like that. Because why? Because there's a, there's a lack of devotion somewhere. And what we find here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, that it says when kings were supposed to go to war, David, who was the king, stayed home. David stayed home, right? And it's in that staying home. Mind you, there's nothing wrong with staying home. There's nothing wrong with taking a day off. There's nothing wrong with taking a day of rest. But the scripture says, no king, you were supposed to go to war. 
And so David, when he chose not to do what he, what's his responsibility, God-given responsibility to do, it was then that David saw Bathsheba taking a bath. He ended up inviting her to his house. And then when she came to his house, um, he ended up sleeping with her, her being a married woman. Then he ended up killing her husband, right? And then he ended up marrying her to try to cover it up because she was pregnant, right? And all these disasters happen in his life purely because, not because he went out there and cussed God, not because he went out there and, and did some outbroken sin at first. No, the reason why it happened, because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And if he would have gone to war, which was his responsibility, he would have never saw Bathsheba. If he would have never saw Bathsheba, then he would have never impregnated her. If he would have never impregnated her, then the baby would not have been born. And if the baby was not been born, then the baby would not have died. And if the baby would not have died, Uriah, her husband, would not have been killed, etc., etc. You go, it is a trickle-down effect. And so, so many of us have failed to realize that God is calling us to a life of holiness. And that is a life of devotion, that you must be devoted to God in order for the altars of your heart and the altars of your life to give fruit in your lives. Your altars will always be barren. Your altars will always be messed up. Right. If you look at Isaiah chapter um, 66, the book of Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah chapter 66, and when you get there and you look at um, verse 8, verse 8 says, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? It says, once it says, shall a nation be born at once? It says, for as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. In other words, as soon, Zion represents the people of God. And what God is saying, God is saying, stop thinking that your life is going to turn around by osmosis. Stop thinking that the things of your life is just going to turn around just because you prayed about it. No, the things in your life will turn around when you labor for God. When you surrender your life um, to God, that's what holiness is. The first part of holiness, before you can get into purity in deeds or moral code or structure or do's and don'ts and and can's and cannots and touch and touch not and handle and handle not before you can get into that the, the before you can even become holy in the way you live the question is have you devoted your life to god have you given it to the lord have you given the reins, the steering wheel, the, 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 the driver's seat? And have you gotten out of the driver's seat and sat now in the passenger seat and saying, Jesus, you take the wheel. You lead me. You guide me. Right? Because that is the first part. This is why people who are living in the kingdom of God, they can preach, they can teach, they can sing, they can minister, but if they haven't devoted all of themselves to the Lord, then yes, they will have a prevailing proclivity that they're always dealing with. And I'm, I'm telling you that by experience in my own life, and I'm telling you that even by the counsel of God's holy word, is that you will not be able to break the strongholds over your life if you do not or if you refuse to devote yourself to the Lord. And what do I mean by that? Not just in one area, but in all areas, in every part of you. When you surrender that stuff, when you surrender all of you to the Lord, right? It, that's when Zion travails. 
That's when Zion travails. That's when Zion, Zion represents the people of God. When Zion is in labor, when Zion is serving God, when Zion is, is pushing into the presence of God, it is then that Zion will bear fruit. Okay? When you look at, um, let's look at Psalms chapter 50. Thank you, Father. When you look at Psalms chapter 50, And um, Psalms chapter 50 and verse uh, 1 and 2, it says, The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. So the question is, how much of God is being seen in you? Not just on Sundays or when you're talking to believers, but I'm saying when you are amongst sinners. Because when you are amongst believers who also have God, your light, though it is seen, your light is not as brightly seen as when it is around people of the world. People of the world will know when you don't, when you're not like them. They'll know it. They'll know it. And we have, today in today's time, people of God, we have so much mockery against the house of God as if every one of us represents the kingdom of God, as if every one of us represents Jesus, and we do. And so we have so much mockery against the kingdom of God because of men and women that have refused to devote themselves completely in every area to the to to God's ways. And and this is what I believe is the reason why there's so much prevailing sin. There's so much prevailing um um deterioration that's going on into the world. Let's look at um the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And when you get to Isaiah chapter 1, um, verse beginning at verse 2, it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, abroad of, of evil doers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, they have turned away backward. He says in verse 5, why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. He says, here's the results. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Look at what he says in verse 8. So the daughter of Zion is left, she's abandoned, as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord has left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. It is important to know that what happens, it says that because of the fact, because we have not devoted our lives, devoted every area of our lives and allow God to have precedence, to allow him to have the primary place in our lives. What we, here's the question, what are you devoted to? What are you devoted to that come rain or shine, that's what you do, right? Whatever you're devoted to that, that you do all the time is your God. That's your God. That whatever you devote yourself to that you do no matter what, 
You're going to devote yourself to it. You're going to prepare for it. You're going to plan for it. That's your God. And it's important to know that that's where you have to get your strength from. You're not going to get it from God because God says, I will not have any other God before me. So what happens is that the reason why the altars of our hearts, the reason why the altars of the churches, the reason why the altars of life in this world are barren and they're not bearing fruit is because of the fact of that we have refused to surrender our lives and to keep it holy, to keep it righteous, to keep it set apart, separate and set apart, that this is, 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 is something that I have devoted to God. The scripture says it teaches us that Jesus says, he says, do you think that I came to bring peace? He says, no, I came to bring a sword. That sword is going to divide daughter from mother-in-law and, and son from father and daughter from father and, and children from parents and, and parents from, from grandchildren. And so like that. it's going to divide us. But what happens is that most of us, in some ways, many of us are really, and we're not trying to be holy, but we're trying to be culturally relevant. We're trying to be culturally, and many churches have, have, have dropped the standards of holiness and now is trying to be culturally relevant. What do I mean by that? They're trying to fit in just to fill pews. They're trying to, you're trying to fit in just to keep your family liking you. You're trying to fit in just so that everybody will talk nice things about you. And because you're trying to fit in, you will not tell somebody who is wrong they are wrong. You know, the word of God, when you talk about the standards of God, the standards of God says that when, when certain people are doing certain things, the scripture says, don't even eat with them. Don't even sit down and eat with them. Why? Because the scripture says that they might be shamed in what they're doing. So many of us have lowered the standards just because this is our child, this is our baby, this is our boo, and oh my God, well, if I if I let them go, what will happen if I abandon them, if I if I cut them off and they get into trouble, then I'm gonna feel guilty. No, you that's a selfish form of thinking. Because the scripture says in the book of Proverbs, it says that if you do not discipline your child, it is because you hate them. It's not about being harsh. It's not about being evil. It's not because, because correction, I oftentimes tell people this, correction is not hatred. Correction is love. If you see somebody crossing the street and, and you see a truck coming, you, you're not going to say, excuse me, um, can you please, um, I don't mean to judge you. I don't mean to um, you know, ridicule you and I'm not condemning you. But um, I believe that there's a truck coming and can you please um, just uh, move? By that time, the person is dead. Dead. And while we're sugarcoating and while we are appeasing the emotionalism of people, right? Souls are dying and being lost for eternity. And how can we stand before God and say, God, I loved you, but I was ashamed of you in front of my family. Or I was ashamed of you in front of my children. Listen, my job as a parent is just to prepare my children for life here and life hereafter. And so one of the things I've done with my kids is that I've taught them. I've taught them. Some of my kids have had more intensified training because of the fact they've been with me longer, right? And, and some kids had um, a small training, but either way, they were trained. And the one thing that my kids, if they would be totally honest with you, and if my family would be totally honest with you, yeah, have they seen flaws in my life? Absolutely. But when they saw the flaws, they saw a man that was saying, God, forgive me. God, wash me. God, come into my heart. And then they saw a man who was devoted and who is devoted to God. In fact, sometimes there have been times some of my children have even said that I think you love the church and you love God's people more than you love us. And I'm like, no, my child, no, my son, no, my daughter, but I love the Lord and I love what God is doing in the life of his people. And that's all I want for you. I want for you to be born again, because if you are born again, then all this stuff and everything that goes on in life you'll then understand why things are happening. And when things don't happen right, God's word gives you direction so that even in a dark world, you still can see. 
you still can 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 look out and and still have hope. Listen, when when Barack Obama, you know, left office because he had to leave office, not because he wanted to, not because we couldn't vote on him, and but he had to leave. He cannot do more than two terms. And so I wasn't sitting there crying, oh, Obama. No, I wasn't doing that, right? And then when Donald Trump came in and Hillary didn't make it, I wasn't sitting there crying, no, I want Hillary. No, I wasn't doing that. I was saying, you know what? To God be the glory. God, you're still in control. And it is my duty as a man of God to pray for whoever is in authority. It is my duty to pray for him. And it's my duty to remind people, stop looking at man. Stop looking at what men can do and what men can say for the Bible has already told us. God has already told us that the love of many shall wax cold. So am I shocked by racism? No. Am I shocked by people lying? No. They've been lying all for all life, all generations. They've been lying forever. What politician has ever told the truth? So Donald Trump is not anything unique. You know, they've been lying ever. You know, you look at the news stations, you know, they would rather report on chaos and misery. Why? Because it keeps you watching. They don't want to report on somebody who got saved. That's not exciting. But, oh, if Bishop so-and-so was sleeping with some, some, somebody, oh, my God, everybody's watching the news. You're all on Facebook. You're all on YouTube. You're all, because you have not understood the kingdom of God. You're now being conformed to this world versus being transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It is important to know that you know when you when you come to the knowledge of the truth and you see God for who he is, then you're not moved by this stuff. You're not frantically worried about this stuff. Why? Because you know that this whole earth is going to hell in a gasoline-soaked underwear basket full of gasoline. You know that we're going to be, that this world is going to be destroyed. Why? Because we have not been sent here to stay. We've been sent here to be light in darkness, salt in a saltless world, so that we might go and tell somebody that Jesus is the answer for the world today. That we might go and tell somebody, I know that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why? Because he saved me and changed me. But if you, the believer, right, can't find victory, then what you got to say to anybody out there? If you can't find control over yourself, then how can you tell the drug addict that God can help you get off of drugs? The world gets off of drugs to become addicted to something else. But just because that person who got off of drugs um, cleans themselves up, gets married, buy a house, have kids, you know, uh, saves money, buys a car, buys a plane, buys a boat, buy all that stuff, and they still go to hell, what good is it? What good is it? There is no difference between them being on drugs, going to hell, or them having their life together, going to hell. It's no different. It's a waste. Because if you compare a uh, 100 years on this earth to eternity, 100 years is nothing. For the Bible says one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So what can you compare your life to on this earth? So the, the, the premise of what we're supposed to do as people of God is to let the holiness of God, by devoting ourselves to, 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 to the Lord, let the holiness of God come upon us. And as we devote ourselves to God, then you know what? Then we'll put a watch to our mouths. As we devote ourselves to God, then our bodies will be pure. Not only in, in, in holiness as far as, you know, staying away from anything that is wicked or anything that is of this world, but also in how you eat. You're going to take care of this body. Why? Because you're devoting yourself to God and you know that how can I serve the Lord if I'm physically out of shape? How can I serve the Lord if I'm not healthy? 
right? If I'm looking in the mirror and every time I look in the mirror, I'm frustrated at what I see. If every time you look in the mirror, you're aggravated and you look at yourself and you keep trying to tuck and hide and, and pack in and, and you keep trying to do that, then what happens, it affects how you minister because the enemy knows you're sensitive about that. So when you start to do the will of God, all he got to get is some knucklehead to say, girl, you look like you're gaining weight. Now you're shattered, you're upset, you're mad all the rest of the day. Okay, or if you see your spouse or somebody in your family or somebody that you like, if you see them looking at somebody who you think looks better than you, now you got an issue. But see, when you devote yourself to God, you recognize that because I rec because I represent God, because God is in me and everywhere I go, I represent him, then it, it causes me to effectively change what I do. So what happens, the result of holiness in the way I walk is, is directly related to the level of devotion that I have to my Heavenly Father. And so what happens is that when you see somebody fall, stop looking at the fall. Start praying, God, bring them back to devoting to you, to devotion to you. Because oftentimes I've seen people, and I've even seen this in my life, right? Where times when God has used me powerfully. God has used me through his anointing, um, through laying hands on people and people have been healed. God has used me with, with the, the power of the word to speak a, a, a word in due season. And that person's life has been transformed. I've seen so many things happen in my life. I've seen times where I prayed and said, God, I need this and I want this. And all of a sudden that exact thing I pray for, it comes immediately. And I've seen miracles happen in my life, right? And many of you don't know. The doctors told my mother that I would never walk on my own without a prosthetic leg. And my mother prayed and God made miracles to happen in my life. There were several times in my life where the enemy tried to kill me and take me out. There were several times in life where my life was on the line and God miraculously saved me for a purpose that was bigger than me. So now once God saves me, once God saves you, and you get relaxed in that thing, and you start getting gelled in that thing, and then you start forgetting the God who saved you, then what you will find yourself, you'll find yourself coming to the place where now you are a child of God, but you have a barren altar. You have a barren altar, and you got nothing but, you got Jesus, but you also got a whole lot of sins. You got Jesus, so you got pastors and preachers and teachers that are that are saying, you know, oh, the power of God, but yet and still they're not experiencing the power of God in their lives. So they have proclivities, they have weaknesses, they have all these different things. Why? Because there is a lack of devotion. There's a lack of dedication. If you read the book of Leviticus, which is the book of holiness, um, that God speaks about holiness in all different facets. If you read what God was talking about when he was talking about Aaron, and he, he, he talked about, he described what Aaron had to wear and how everything had to be. Even the, the, the eprod that he would put on, it had to have an opening in a certain place. And then it had to be embroidered because God says, don't you dare let it tear. Don't let it tear, like because if he pulled his head over it and he pulled his head over it, over that hole, and he pulls it and maybe his head is a little bit big and then all of a sudden it rips. No, God said, make it that it would not tear. Then God says, I want you to put on the bottom of his robe these bells and pomegranate. So it would be a pomegranate, a bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, bell. And the scripture says that he would wear it and the sound of it would be when he's going in and out of the kingdom of God, of the presence of God. And he says, do it, otherwise he'll die. So when you look at the holiness of God, God specifically gave directions to everything that man would do, all the do's and the do nots. And what a lot of Christians have done, they've taken those do's and do nots and they use that as rule over your life. Not realizing biblically, not understanding biblically, is that God didn't go to Egypt and give the people the rules of Leviticus. No. God first had to take them out of Egypt and bring them to his holy mountain of worship, right? Of devotion. And so when God, what God does in our lives is that he brings us out of sin and then he teaches us about devotion. This is why so many people, some people even in my own church, 
have a problem with saying, well, pastor, I feel like God called me to do this. And I feel like God called me to do that. But in my spirit, I'm like, but you're not devoted to God. You're still in your worldly mindset. You're still in your world. So I cannot put you in that area until you first demonstrate devotion. That's why the word of God says that don't pick a novice. Otherwise, they'll get exalted in pride and they'll fall away. But you got to pick people who are faithful. Paul told Timothy, he says, the same things that I taught you, commit that unto faithful men who shall teach others also. So that means before you can commit it to them, they got to first prove themselves faithful. And so holiness or, or being holy before God is not just merely about don't do this and don't do this and yeah, you're perfect and you're perfect and you're perfect. No, that's not what holiness is. Holiness, that stuff is a result of, of your holiness towards God. In other words, devotion. Set apart for God. The more you set apart yourself for God, the more you say, well, you know what? I'm going to set apart my time for God. Then you're going to find your time. You're going to start making decisions about your time that are in line with God's word, right? The more that you devote your mind to God, then you're going to find that your mind is going to start having thoughts of God versus thoughts of this world. So if you're battling with depression, if you're battling with confusion, if you're battling with anxieties, if you're battling with fears, if you're battling with anger, if you're battling with frustrations, it is because you're not devoting that mind to God. He says he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. So when you devote yourself to God, right? Then he will then take control of that area. And now you'll no longer pray, oh God, fix this area because it'll be automatically fixed through devotion. Remember, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branch. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So I want you, if you will, as an example, and I'm going to grab a piece of paper for this. As an example, right? And, and this is the crude methodology, right? Crude methodology, and so y'all, just forgive and, and just be patient with this crude methodology, okay? So, I don't know if you can see that, but imagine if this is a tree trunk. This is a tree trunk, okay? And imagine this tree trunk is you, and imagine the, the branches are different components of you, okay? As the branches are different components of you, then what happens is that, imagine this, as you connect each component to God, then that branch is able to bear fruit. That branch is that area of your life is able to bear fruit as you connect it. So imagine, you know, your mind being one branch and imagine your relationship being another branch and imagine your uh, sexuality being another branch and imagine your finances being another branch and, and imagine, just keep imagining every component of your life as branches, extensions of who you are, extensions of who you are, right? As you connect each of those things and devote those things to God, then those things will then start drawing from the presence of God, the power of God to make it act right, to make it act right. So if you want to be a better parent, devote your parenting to God. Learn what God says about parents and how you are to raise children and devote that to God and you'll be a better parent. Does it mean your children will accept it? No, because here's the caveat. The people in your life will not accept you unless they agree with you. So that means if your children have decided to follow the ways of this world and you decided to devote yourself to God, stop thinking that they're going to say hallelujah and amen. No. They're going to say hallelujah and amen when they see Jesus in you and the Holy Spirit dwells, deals with their heart. And as the Holy Spirit convicts their hearts and converts their hearts, then your child will rise up and say hallelujah. But as long as your child is devoted to the world, as long as your child is, is a child of the world, then your child will only agree with its own kind. And so stop demoralizing yourself and stop lowering the standards of God just to fit the whims 
of your family and your children and your friends and the people around you. No, you have been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light that you should show forth his praises, that you should show forth the power of God, the victory of God, the anointing of God, the truth of God, the wisdom of God. And the more you devote yourself to God and you have no areas that are connected to this world, the less of the, the sinful things that you will find in your life. When you look at uh, Romans, thank you, Father. When you look at Romans uh, chapter 7, Romans chapter 7 and um, verse 18. Verse 18 says, Romans chapter 7, verse 18. It says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. In other words, I have a will, I have a desire to do the right thing, but to perform it, I can't find it. In other words, you know, I said, how many of you have, have maybe even said it, you don't have to answer, but how many of you have said, you know what, I'm not going to fall in that area no more. But then all of a sudden you find yourself falling in it again. Why? Because there's a lack of devotion. Okay. Look at verse 19. For the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So we have to understand that the reason why we fall, the reason why we fail is because there is sin in us. What is sin? Sin is, is missing the mark of God or, de, um, or disconnecting yourself from God to do it your own way. The scripture says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own own way. But God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. So in other words, sin is me doing what I want to do. Whereas God says, Jesus says, if you're going to come after me, let him first deny himself. So that means if I'm going to serve God, I got to deny what Rodney wants to do. But as long as because I know sin is in me, as long as I start to obey the voice of sin that's in me, then guess what? That obedience to sin will cause for sin to have dominion over me. However, if I refuse the voice that's within me of sin and I devote myself and delight in the words of God, in the presence of God, then by virtue of my devotion, my decisions will be different and I will live a life that glorifies God. And I will no longer be barren. I want you to turn with me and, and this is, um, I, I guess this would be probably our last scripture for tonight. Um, I want you to turn with me to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. And we're going to read from verses one through verse nine. It reads, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multitude, multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, the only way you're going to partake of God's divinity, his divine nature in you to change you, to fix those things that's wrong in you, the only way you're going to partake of it is if you have committed yourself and have 
through the knowledge of Christ, the, the, taking in the knowledge of Christ. We, we uh, quote it today in our prayer where the scripture says, how can a, a young person or anyone for that matter cleanse their way? It says, by taking heed to thy word, with my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. For thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So it's important to know that he says that you will escape the corruption that is in the world through lust if you increase the knowledge and devotion of yourself to God. You're gonna, when you do that, you're going to escape that corruption. But if you don't do that, then you're going to have corruption. If you do that in some areas, but you don't do it in all areas, in the area that you don't do it is the area that you will fall. For the, for the enemy doesn't come at the place where you're watching. No, he comes at the place that you're not watching. So if you're watching the front door, the enemy is going to come through the back door. That's why you can't afford to have any part of your life connected with this world. I, I tell believers all the time, if you are a worship leader, if you are a worship leader, you should not be listening to worldly music because you cannot enter people into a realm of worship and perfection and beauty of the Holy Spirit when you're tainted with so much of what the world has to offer. And yes, I know that when you were in the world, just like when I was in the world, there was many songs that back in the day I used to dance to, that I used to party to. There's many songs that, that has like a deep affinity to, towards me. But guess what? You've been called out of that stuff into God's marvelous light so that you might distinguish, distinguish between good and evil, right and wrong. And that people, when they see you, they should only see Jesus. They shouldn't see you in your car bumping to all kinds of music. They shouldn't see you on Facebook, Facebook Live, bumping to all kinds of ungodly music because you never know if that person that tuned into your page that day is looking for Jesus. But instead, they see the club bumper. They see the club hopper. They see the one who's a, a gigolo. They see the one who's a player. They see the one who is, you don't know when they're coming. So the question is, as back in the day, the saying used to say, is you is or is you ain't my baby? You know, the, the question is, are you for real or are you Memorex? Are you a child of God? Whose side are you on? Can we, can we know that at all times? Can we know that in every situation? That you are on the Lord's side. That you have a desire for God. And, and guess what? When you have that devotion to God, it is God. That's why the word of God says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is God that does the cleansing. It is God that washes away all the sin. It is God that changes your life and transforms your life. But it happens when you decide to devote yourself. It happens when you decide to say, you know what? I've lived in this life. I've done what I wanted to do in the world. But now God has opened my eyes and said, you know what? Follow me. So that means I must let go of something. It's like if you're running a race, you can't run a race effectively looking behind you. You can't. You got to face forward. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, I press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. But in verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, but also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Add to virtue knowledge. Add to your knowledge self-control. Add to self-control perseverance. Add to perseverance, godliness. Add to your being godly, brotherly kindness. And add to brotherly kindness, love. Verse 8, for if these things are yours and they abound, you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted 
even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. In other words, if you keep trying to have the best of the world and the best of the kingdom of God, guess what? You're not going to receive the kingdom of God because Jesus said, he says, I would that you were hot or cold. He said, but because you have decided to be lukewarm, you decided to be in the middle. He says, I'm going to throw you up. And so the reason why people look godly, but they haven't experienced the power of God is because they haven't decided to follow Jesus. And so God bless you tonight. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this time together. And we thank you for your holy word. Father, I pray that you would bless your people, that you would bless from me and everyone that is watching this, Lord God, that we would have a heart that is fully devoted to you. A heart that, Lord God, continually, Lord God, we surrender more and more of us to you, Lord God, that you might take the first place, that you might show us the way that we ought to take, Lord God, the things that we should do. God, help us in the name of Jesus to decide to follow you. For you said if we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, then everything we have need of will be added. So bless your people and bless those who will watch these videos and those who will share these videos to others. Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would open our eyes, that we would turn from our wicked ways, and that, Father, we would seek your face and we would pray, Lord God, and we would humble ourselves so that you might hear from heaven, forgive us of our sins, and heal our land. So bless us tonight in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all. God bless you, Trisha. God bless you, Angela. Have a blessed and marvelous day. I look forward to studying with you again on Monday evening. Uh, please make sure you share this video. Point your friends to it. Uh, God bless you, Jacqueline. God bless you, Angela. Have a great evening. Amen. Thank you, Jacqueline. Appreciate it. But let's devote our lives to the Lord. God bless you, Tanisha. Good night, Veretta. God bless you. Amen, Trisha. God bless you. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Tanisha. Amen. Gloria, God bless you from Maryland. God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> God bless you, Eloise. God bless you, Leslie. Amen. Everyone have a great evening. God bless everyone.